we are live well i woke up this morning to an email from ryan shout out to you ryan you are the bomb really appreciate you man and he sent me some at flutter stuff but there was one pdf that he sent me one link that was really intriguing because it was about the propagation and the ether and as you all know my uh my whole argument of the ether, there's no evidence for it, and it can't be defined correctly, so therefore it doesn't exist. But I could be wrong. So I am definitely will be eating humble pie if I'm shown wrong. Um, and then I will do an apology to everybody that I said the thing doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, so this is a us going through the, the paper together and then we'll see um, what happens, what's actually standing in the paper. But uh, yeah, I might be wrong, guys. Let's, let's check this out. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Woo-wee. Okay. Hey, uh, Mandela Effect, good to see you, man. Thank you for coming. I'm glad you could make it. It's good to see you. Okay. Ooh, how do I get this? There, that's a bit better. Okay, so this is from the Iowa State University Digital Respiratory Care. So, retrospective thesis and dissertations. 1962, guys. The Flat Earth Approximation to the Solution of Electromagnetic Propagation in the Stratified Terrestrial Atmosphere. This is by Robert Algon. Uh, post it's in the Iowa State University. Please excuse the children behind me. It is early morning and uh, they are awake. <laughs> this was an unplanned live, but it's uh, it's good to see you all here. What's up, Steve Finneman? Good to see you. Logic Observation, uh, Mr. Superwinder, and uh, Roger Ledball. Glad to have you guys in. Yeah, we're going to go through this stuff together. And uh, could this be evidence? or at least a working model for the ether. And then I will eat my words and say, uh, sorry guys, whoever I said the ether doesn't exist. I am more than willing and humble to admit when I was wrong. But it's good to see you guys. Okay, let's do this. It's always good to see this. So yeah, again, shout out to you, J Ryan, for sending me this email, really appreciate it. Okay, this dissertation has been microfilmed exactly as received. Post Robert uh, Algon, 1928, the flat earth approximation to the solution of electromagnetic propagation in the stratofield terrestrial atmosphere. Woo! Iowa State, University of Science and Technology, PhD 962. Really looking forward to this, guys. Because as I said before, I've never ever come across any evidence for the ether. And if this is a, what is a pushed as propagation medium for for everything on the ether and on earth i'll be more than happy to eat humble pie but uh, it's good to see you guys um hey mr guest jeff guess it good to see you man glad you could make it as well always glad you guys could uh, come by let me know if any of you want to hop in sometime then i can put a link there for you guys just let me know okay let's go okay uh a dissertation submitted to the graduate faculty and partial Fulfillment of the requirements of the degree of doctor, doctor of philosophy. So, major subject, electrical engineering. It's approved. The signature was, redact was redacted for privacy, obviously. Uh, signature was redacted and signature was okay. Iowa State, 1962. I hereby request that the changes listed below, which I desire to make in the manus manuscript copy of the thesis submitted for the degree doctor of philosophy, be approved. Signed. The term expert, okay, be changed to JA in equation. Obviously, guys, I have no clue what's going on with the equations. I'm going to be straightforward, <laughs> so don't expect me to know. <laughs> hey, Chilean, good to see you, man. Glad you could make it. Uh, but uh, we'll go through as best as we can and see what's going on. These changes will affect the calculated curves plotted on figures two and four by increasing the slope of the curves. So in other words, they, it says it's taking the... Uh, calculations and it's just changed a few things on the equation which makes the slope increase increasing the slope of the curves of it so obviously it's showing a a curved slope with the uh information 
Okay, tables of content introduction, propagation in a stratified atmosphere, definition of the problem, Maxwell's equations for the inhydrogenous atmosphere, the magnetic dipole, the electric dipole, the flat earth approximation, Ooh, looking forward to that, the area integral, the Green's function. So the complete solution for the magnetic dipole, the complete solution for the electric dipole, comparison with experimental data, that's what I'm looking forward to as well, extending the Green's function to include the effects of elevated stratifications, conclusions, bibliography, and acknowledgements. Woohoo, looking forward to this. Okay, who else is in? Uh, guys, please hit the likes, share the show. Uh, really do appreciate you all coming. You guys are an awesomeness. Really appreciate you all. Uh, maybe I should put up a poll. I think, how's that? I think that's a good idea. Let me quickly get a poll up and running. Uh, studio. By the way, I hope you guys all slept well. I slept great until my child just... You know, they woke me up at like 6 a.m. again. That's the whole reason I woke up early again. I was hoping I could at least get to 7 o'clock. But alas, no, that does not happen in this lifetime. Not with children. Oh, went out. YouTube. Uh, I got a super chat. Roger Ledwell, thank you very much for the super chat. Hit, hitting the E for live. Love it. <laughs> I'm glad we can do it live, Roger. I really appreciate you, man. You guys rock. Okay, let me quickly set up a poll for you to keep us engaged. Will this show the ether to be true? Yes, no, maybe. There we go. There's the poll for you guys. Uh, thank you again for your super chat, mate. I really appreciate it, Roger. You rock. Okay. So we'll see in a few minutes what the poll says. And uh, take it up from there. Hey, Gary Wright, Bingo. Glad for you. Yeah, bedtime. <laughs> I just woke up, so uh, whatever. Okay, introduction. The problem for the propagation of electromagnetic energy around a spherical body where the diameter of the sphere is large with respect to the wavelength of the energy was first solved by Lord Rayleigh in terms of an infinite series of spherical harmonics. The solution was practically useless from the engineering point of view because of the large number of terms required to approximate the final answer. Subsequently, Watson developed a transformation which transformed the infinite series into a contour integral, which is then evaluated by the method of residue. The residues of the integral involve uh, asymptotic uh, expansions of the Hankel functions of order of one third of the area integrals. A second approach to the problem and the approach which serves as the basis of this paper is that developed by Price and uh, Pecaris, in which the Earth is assumed to be flat and the atmosphere homogeneous. Obviously, we know two facts coming out of this. The Earth is flat, guys. No doubt about that. And uh, yes, the atmosphere is homogeneous. No doubt about that. So that's really cool. Uh, it's a good start for this paper so far. So we'll take it on there. Uh, the solution now reduces to an infinite integral of zero ordered Bessel functions. Schelling and Burroughs proposed a model wherein the Earth was assumed to have a modified radius of about four thirds to actual radius and the Earth's atmosphere was assumed to be homogeneous. This model was used to account for the gradient of the refractive index of Earth's atmosphere. All these models refer to the so-called normal mode of propagation as distinguished from the turbulent scatter. Ooh. The theory of propagation of electric magnetic energy, which will be discussed later. Very complete discussions of normal mode theory are included in Telestial Radio Waves by Bremer and volume of the MIT Radiation Laboratory Series. Propagation of the short radio waves. So in other words, they're talking about radio waves passing through our beloved Atmos plane. Hey, Fluff Daddy, what's up? Good to see you, man. Glad you could make it. Do raccoons wear a mask? Was it just their fur? <laughs> Roger. <laughs> we don't get raccoons yet, so I can't tell you. Maybe it's spray paint. Uh, where, 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 where? Uh, are we on page two now? Okay, yeah. So the results are very extensive investigation into the propagation of radio waves and the normal modes of the atmosphere. 
the results indicated that the classical airless earth, so in other words, earth without air, models were not valid for calculating the effects of internal reflections of the stat stratified atmosphere. Hmm. Obviously, you need the atmosphere for uh, radio waves and things to propagate through. This is interesting because if you do need the atmos to for uh, the radio waves to propagate through, how can they claim radio waves in space? That's just a thought. That's actually very interesting stuff. Okay, so in uh, 1959, Tukizi published a theory which, while using a different approach to the problem, achieved results which had excellent comparison with experiment and uh, which are corroborate, corroborated by this analysis. Tukizi's results indicate the utility of the normal mode theory in predicting the strength of the field in the diffraction region and especially in predicting the radial and attenuation of the field in the diffraction region. The term diffraction region, as referred to by Tukizi and a number of other authors, stems from the theory that the presence of the field over the horizon from the source is due to diffraction process caused by the curvature of Earth. <laughs> this is like, uh, reminds me of when, remember when Dave McKeegan was saying, oh, the reason uh, the knickerbine was working because diffraction. So in other words, the, the, uh, the uh, beam was diffracted enough over the Earth's curvature to give uh, a reading. Yeah, okay, so much diffraction, if you say so. Okay, so uh, other authors call this same phenomenon by different names. For example, Carol and Ring use the term twilight region. Mm -hmm. In this paper, the terminology which is favored by the prop proponents of the turbulent scatterer theories will be used. Trans Trans-horizon field. This will mean that field which is over the horizon from the source. The other theory of propagation of short radio waves over the horizon was first introduced by Booker and Gordon in 1950. Basically, the Booker-Gordon theory is that spherical or ellipsoidal anomalies in the refractive index act as scatterers of electromagnetic energy. These anomalies, often called blobs, are supposedly located in the common volume of the uh, transmitting and receiving antenna beams and serve to scatter some of the transmitted energy down to the receiver. Uh, yeah, um, I've actually read some of the stuff like that where let's say they have a radar and uh, they, they have, it goes out and they have, uh, you can call it like a shaded area. So where it's supposed to stop, it still has a scattering of past there where it diffracts scatters. So they're saying that the air just pushes that uh, that signal out further to be able to get scattered and obviously get received. Without the Atmos, you won't be able to do that. Great. Okay, so turbulence atmosphere. The turbulence can be described in a statistical fashion and therefore several theories concerning turbulence which serve as the basis for these arguments. The advantage of the turbulence scatterer theory is that the statistics of the turbulence lead directly to a statistical character for the field in the diffraction region. In normal mode theory, the atmosphere is assumed to be static so that there is no statistical, char statist yeah, statistical character to the transitional field, trans horizon field, sorry. The turbulence scatter theory is very attractive from the number of points of view most of which involve the statistical character of the field in the trans-horizon region. The most significant shortcoming in the turbulence scatter theory is that the intensity of the turbulence or the variation in the index of refraction in the scattering blobs is not sufficiently large to account for the fields observed since the most cases, the common volume of the antennas is very high in the troposphere. At the present time, the Booker-Gordon theory is most widely accepted can you have a bit softer so that's a bit below? Sorry guys, let's get that sort of put softer. Oh, apologies children you know <laughs> um so where was i oh yes concerning last night remember i would have spoken to ozian 
But um, we got the, somehow he got the dates mixed up because we said the sixth. But uh, I think yeah. So that's tonight now, not last night. But I did go on the on his show last night for like five or ten minutes. But uh, yeah, it was supposed to be t last night. Well, this morning for me, but. We're doing it tonight, the chat on biblical cosmology. Okay, let's carry on. The present analysis uses the flat earth approximation applied to the normal mode theory of trans horizon propagation. The results reported by Bryce are achieved in different techniques and analysis extended. To include the effects of inhomogeneous atmosphere with a constant gradient of refractive index. Finally, a technique used for approximating an arbitrary profile of refractive index is developed and two model atmospheres are considered. Field strengths calculated on the basis of the analysis are compared with experimental data reported by Dinger, Garner, Hamilton, and Tiekman with good results. Okay, so now this is part two, the propagation in Stansfield atmosphere definition of the problem. So this is the problem that obviously they've had on a spherical Earth. The problem is considered is that the propagation of electromagnetic energy around a spherical Earth from a source located at some point or above the surface of the Earth. The atmosphere of the Earth will be assumed to be spherically stratified. This is the index of refraction is a function of the radius. The coordinate system for the spherical Earth is shown in figure one. The source is located at the point radius equals A plus D, where A is the radius of the Earth. Okay, so R, sorry. So R is probably distance. Radius of the Earth is A, thus D is the height of the source above the Earth. So, yeah. Okay, so it's the uh, corner system. So, so it's, sorry, I'm conscious of the sound behind me. Okay, sorry guys, I just can't concentrate with the TV blabbering behind me like this now. Yes. And now they can't decide what they want to watch together. Okay, so where were we? The source located at point R. Okay. So that would be the way of equaling the uh, equals the A, which is the radius of Earth, and D, the height of the source above the surface of Earth. Okay, so this is like the antenna, which would give how far the height and the radius of Earth would be okay. The analysis concerned the transition field only since the intent analysis. But notice, guys, if it's doing this radius, that would be a geometric radius. <laughs> Jeff got a got a boat bike. That's awesome, Jeff. I think you got the GSXR, correct? As far as I know, that's quite cool. Uh, okay, the analysis considered the trans horizon field only since intent of analysis, the developed analytical in technique which will allow piecewise linear approximation to any profile of refractive index. The trans horizon field will be solved for both magnetic and electric dipole sources located in the atmosphere having a linearly varying profile of refractive index. The solution will be compared to the result obtained by Price in the homogeneous atmosphere. This will be the case of profile refractive index with zero slope. Uh, the article by Price is a base of present analysis. Since the Earth flattening transformation and the air integral solution with its rapidly convergent asymptotic, asymptotic expansion is a very attractive technique, it should be pointed out that Price solved for the case of vertical and horizontal dipoles rather than the case of electrical and magnetic dipoles considered in this analysis. The essential difference lies in the fact that there are no... Oh no, as, as a muthal variations to consider when using the elementary dipoles as opposed to more practical tenors of prices analysis. Okay, the spherical polar coordinates of the problem. So they got the radius with A and the D, so that's giving the angle to follow through. Okay, cool. Oh, the fact that the elementary antennas of this analysis are not practical antennas, configurations do not detract from the significance of result, which because it's a ratio of energy in the trans horizon region to, en to energy which has traveled a corresponding distance in free space, which has direct application in engineering problems. 
This ratio would be the same for any antenna configuration of a given polarization. Thus, it is simple matter to estimate the strength of the field in the trans horizon region from the free space field strength. The analysis will begin with Maxwell's equations from which our Hertzian vectors will both be, both the magnetic and electric dipoles will be developed. The components of the electric and magnetic fields for both types of polarization will be expressed in terms of Hertz vectors. The inogenous wave equation for the Hertz vector will be reduced to a pair of single dimension differential equations by the separation of variables technique. So guys, it's going to be a lot of reading obviously tonight because uh, it's 95 pages and we need to see what this is all about because the the, uh, the heading was very, very um, compelling. Uh, Yamaha. Got a Yamaha. Nice. Okay, let's carry on. <laughs> Yamaha! He says the best. <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a Kawasaki kind of guy, though. I don't know. I've always been for the ninja. It's just... Mm, the ninja's been my... I don't know, dream bike since I was a child. Or, or even the Ducati. Ooh, but the Ducati's like the, the the Ferraris of the bikes. But yeah, definitely nothing wrong with the Yamaha. I love the, the Yamas are awesome, man. Okay, let's get on. BMW is not bad either. But a lot of people um, love going to BMW W route because it's it's comfortable. You've got good, uh, good quality parts. And, uh, yeah, you know you, you're not going to have quality issues, especially driving if you want to drive long distances. Okay, so... At this point, the flat Earth approximation will be made. The flat Earth approximation is the transformation from spherical polar coordinates to cylindrical coordinates. So what they're doing now, they're making a flat Earth approximation, and uh, they're using to transform it from spherical polar coordinates that to a cylinder coordinates. Okay, so it's like laying, taking a sphere, laying it flat, and then putting it over a cylinder. Okay, after the transformation has been made, the two one-dimensional differential equations will be solved. The Hertz vector will be found by weighing each term for complete orthonorm orth orthonormal set of solutions in one variable by the approximate Green's function of the other variable. The resulting expression will be a Hertz vector for a monochromatic elementary dipole of unit strength. The Green's function technique is well suited to making a piecewise or sexually linear approximation to have arbitrary continuous curves. Remember, guys, arbitrary continuous curve. So it's not really there. They're just making an arbitrary. It's all just mathematical. The resulting uh, ident indefinite integrals are evaluated by means of residue summation of the theory of complex variables. The asymptotic uh, expansion of the area integrals allows the final expression, which is an infinite series, to be approximated by a few terms. This is the Maxwell's equation for the homogeneous atmosphere. Blah, blah, blah. So whereas the electric field intensity vector is the magnetic field intensity vector, O is the conductivity of the medium. So in other words, you see you need the medium for the propagation is the conduct charge in the medium. Is the dielectric constant of the medium. In this case, the permittivity of the medium is a function of the radial distance. Uh, and it is permittivity to medium. The radiation will be assumed to be monochromatic of frequency that is the time dependent on the written in the form. Under this condition, Maxwell's equations can be written in a time independent spherical polar form. So that in other words, they could take, they're taking flat um, propagations and they're trying to put it into spherical uh, ways of function. It's very really interesting. Medium is necessary, exactly. Hey, Duke Newcomb, good to see you, man. Thank you for coming. Glad you could make it. But yeah. Uh, that's true. Einstein didn't want the ether to be true because it actually, at the end of the day, killed his general relativity uh, theory. I'm just going to say theory because that's what they call it today. But there's never been any science for it, which is really sad. It's just mathematical. But uh, yeah, like I said, if if the ether does be shown to be correct, I will eat my words. Definitely. Humble pie. But uh, what I'm getting from this so far is it's talking about we need a propagation media for this, 
the, the scattering and the diffraction of the radio waves to go through, which makes sense. But why would, would that would be what they call the ether? That seems to me that's what they're calling the ether. In other words, they're calling the atmos that we have as the ether. Um, the thing I would that really getting me so far reading this is if we got no homo inhomogeneous uh, atmos in space, how are they able to send radio signals through space then? This debunks then transcommunication in space already. That's just my thought so far. That's what I see. Okay. So we got this point of medium is a function of the radial distance and uh, independent spherical form is okay. That's still just more integrals. The magnetic dipole, a magnetic dipole of strength M is defined to be the loop of a current of magnitude I and the radius R such as M equals limb R I and is characterized by R and I infinite. Okay. The following field relationships. The formulation of the Hertz vector for magnetic dipole in a homogeneous atmosphere shown here is due to Friedman. Maxwell's equations for field components with azimuthal variations in a charge for inhomogeneous non conductive mediums are. Conductive mediums are, okay. By equation, blah, blah, blah. The seemingly arbitrary form of equation four is justified by the fact that it is desired to develop a Hertz vector, which is applicable, applicable to the magnetic dipole. For this reason, the operation above and other somewhat arbitrary definitions in the equation to follow are justified. Using equation four in Maxwell's equation leads to blah, 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 blah. And again, guys, I'm not going to act like I even know what the hell these equations are saying. I am not an Einstein. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, let's go on. An expression, okay, solving equation, substituting equation. Friedman points out that the divergence of equation 9 will result in equation 10. Therefore, it will be sufficient to consider only equation 9, assuming that the Hertz vector is radially directed and given to the equation. Again, this somewhat arbitrary assumption is justified by the fact that it leads to the proper field components. Actually, this Hertz vector must be reduced to the classical free space Hertz vector in the medium is assumed to be homogeneous and it is known that the free space Hertz vector has the same direction as the source dipole. In both cases, the source dipole is orientated radially. That's interesting. So it's just where the, the point of the dipole is, it's where it's going to follow. It's recognized as Holtzman's equation in spherical polar coordinates applied to a function which no, with no azimuthal independence, ah, azimuthal dependence, Thus, it is shown that the magnetic dipole case, the equation to be solved is, regardless of the stratification of the medium. Once the scalar function has been determined, the hence factor vector can be written to the components of the electromagnetic field, can be formulated. The field components are, there we go. The equation must be solved to determine the components of electromagnetic field propagating from the magnetic dipole located in an heterogeneous atmosphere. So for all we're getting is we need an atmosphere. We need the atmosphere for the electromagnetic uh, propagation, which makes sense. Uh, if we read this so far, hold on, on this a minute. What more? If we read this so far, this could mean that, uh, yeah, what's in them could be onto something when they say <clears throat> the reason we get. Uh, a reading of some sort is because of the ether, but that doesn't make sense in the term what we're reading now. Because remember, if we get uh, Witsit in them and they got the, um, the ring laser gyro and they're claiming, you see, it's because of the ether that the propagation is showing different rates of, uh, of drift, or you could say, because of the ether. But how this is explaining the ether to be, the propagation medium would be the atmosphere. So if the Atmos is the ether, then what ether is Witsit and company pushing? Because it doesn't follow with this. Because then it's to say, okay, we can stick something in a vacuum and therefore there's no ether. Which is what, what's really complex in this. This is one of the reasons why I said I've never actually uh, agreed with the ether. Because there's no physical... 
how can I put it? There's no correct definition for the ether. It's just been today. It's it sounds like this tomorrow. It sounds like this. It the it keeps changing. But okay, we're seeing this stuff solving the equation. Blah blah. Okay, again, it is noted that the divergence of the equation. Therefore, it will be sufficient to consider own equation. Assume that Hertz vector is radially directed and given by equation. They're still just making up equations for the, the problems they are solving. So equation 34 looks like the corresponding equation which was developed for the electric dipole, except the terms which are due to the gradient in the permittively, permittivity of the medium. You see, you need the medium for, for it to permeate. The difference is to be expected since the Hertz vector is a measure of the electric field. And since the electric flux intensity must be continuous, the electric field intensity must vary on account of the inner inhomogeneities. What? How do you pronounce it? Inhomogeneities. <laughs> inhomogeneities in the pro permittivity of the medium. Just as the case, the magnetic dipole. Once the scalar has been determined, the Hertz vector is known and the field components are can be formulated. The field components for the electric dipole are... Whoop, okay, in the electric dipole case, the equation which must be solved is... Whoop, whoop, okay, where separation constant is defined such as that the equation 37 38 are quite similar to the corresponding equations for the magnetic dipole. However, equation 38 is more unwidely than either of the other equations. This analysis is confined to an atmosphere with a linearly variant profile of refractive index. Hmm, so they have to make it linear. That, so they need an atmosphere that has a linear profile of refractive index. So in other words, like a, a, <coughs> a gradient, <clears throat> but a linear gradient. This means that the gradient terms of equation will be a number of rather than same function of radius. Thus, certain simplifying assumptions can be made during the analysis. In particular, when considering the portion of the atmosphere in which the gradient of the refractive index is very small, it reduces to the equation developed by magnetic dipole. Having developed expressions suitable for determining the field... Can you have a Suitable for determining the field components of the electromagnetic wave propagating from either of the two source types. The next step is to convert from the spherical geometry of the problem to the cylindrical geometry of the flat earth. Hmm, approximation. Now we get into the flat earth stuff. That's cool. Really enjoy this. Uh, no, they don't really care about experiments. Hey, Nicholas Pitts, what's up? How much... Does a hot air balloon weigh? It must not have any mass since you can't weigh it, right? A hot air balloon weighs without air in it. If you haven't noticed, it's cloth. It has uh, materials. Um, and the air inside the hot air balloon is constantly rushing in and out, if you didn't know that. So it's a bit difficult to weigh a hot air balloon while it's flying, uh, Nicholas. Yeah. Ever thought of that? Okay, so now we move on to the flat earth approximation. The earth flattening approximation is nothing more than a transformation from a spherical polar geometry to a cylindrical geometry. The transformation requirements are, equations are, blah, 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 where the represents radial distance or range and uh, represents height. These are the same transformation equation used by Price, but reduced to the case of no azimuthal variations. The transformation in such that a cone with its apex at the Earth's center becomes a cylinder and the sur surface of the Earth becomes a plane orientated such as the axis of the cylinder is normal to the surface of the plane. This is sort of like, how can I put it, put it this way as um, where they try and explain bending space time. Uh, I don't know if I can draw it out. Let's see if I can maybe draw it out. Yes, uh, Nicholas, everything has mass. Do you even know what mass is? Can you define mass for us, Nicholas? I'm going to see if I can uh, draw space, curving of space, space time for uh, people. Uh, it's a whiteboard marker. Uh, I need a dark pen or something that you guys will be able to see 
Exactly, Nicholas. Everything's made of mass. The only problem is for something to weigh something, it kind of has to be static. Gas is not static. Gas is constantly moving in all directions. Weight is measured with a pressure pushing on, a, on the load cell. might work uh, don't know if it's going to, you see that's how it looks the one will be space and the one will be time so when you put time and time will be up and space will be that way maybe I should make it bigger okay we're going to for instance look at time dilation kind of thing but i'm going to put it in simple terms with uh like a clock if the higher you go up according to like einstein you have more time dilation so the higher you go up the, the slower time will get okay if you have like if you imagine a clock face with time clicking with a clock face and you have a certain integral it's going to stop at a certain point hey taking back eden good to see you man thank you for coming glad you could make it um so let's see what it can do i'm going to draw uh, this is i don't know if i can uh, so you guys can see what i'm actually this might work but now i don't have a <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm trying to figure out how I can get this to, to, sh to work for, so we can all see what's going on here. Whoa. Uh, maybe that will work. Let's see. Okay. Try and draw it this way. Uh, whoopsie. It's good to see you guys. Yeah, what Atmo, <laughs> Stephen one. Atmo what? Atmos gas. That's all the Atmo means. It just means gas. We're not going to say sphere because, as we all know, sphere gas doesn't have inherent shape. It follow. It takes the shape of its container. Now I can't get the damn thing to stand. Okay. So let's put it this way. We got a clock face, and we're going to do it in one second intervals just to make it as simple as possible. So as the clock is turning, ooh, yellow. As the clock is turning, the clock hand is turning. We're going to say that was a second. We got another second, and we got another second, and we're going to just do it like five, five seconds. How's that? Okay. So that shows five seconds on the timeline, okay? Now, with space, because it's going through space, it has to go this, this direction. Now, obviously, the linear function has to be exactly the same. So let's put this in five. Two, three, four, five. Do you see now how it's going to work? Let's place this in seconds. Just to try and explain as simple terms as I can to you guys, uh, time and space spending warping, okay? So, in the time dimension, you'll have five seconds going this way, so the clock would have moved that amount. In the space, because it's bending space, quote-unquote, it's only going to come up to there. So where five seconds was for the time dimension up vertically, space is warping. Hey, taking back Eden, thank you for becoming a member, mate. Really appreciate it. Appreciate all you guys. You guys are awesome. Appreciate all my members and everybody that does support the show. You rock. Okay. So anyway, then according to this time, closer to uh, the earth, it will give a different reading. So it will be, if we counted this as one second, two seconds, that's three seconds. This will be about two and a half seconds. 
So according to space-time, because of the bending and warping of space-time, when you are uh, at a certain distance from the Earth's center, our surface, you will have elapsed. Now, yeah, you would have got, if that was five seconds, this would be two and a half seconds. Get it? And that's what they mean with time, with time dilation. Now, when you have to take this and you have to, how does that work now with a spherical stuff I was talking about? Well, let's turn this around. They are claiming that if you take it and you, okay, now I can probably put this back to normal again. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this. Hey, SI man, good to see you, man. Glad you can make it. Okay. So now if they're taking this, they're saying, well, how is this curving? Well, all they do is they just bend it to a cylinder. Okay, so they bend it to a cylinder. Okay. Now, notice... Now notice this this one it takes a curved path but it's actually straight and uh, that one is just a straight cylinder so so where you have this is where they come with a cone equation I'm just going to quickly draw it they come with a cone so in other words where it is here okay that's the closest. It's going to be one revolution, one revolution around the cone, where because of space time, that same amount of um, of time spent going a distance, let's say here, which is further away, is only going to be that much. It doesn't go a full rotation where closer to the Earth it had a full rotation, and that's how they're explaining space time with everything curving now how does this all fit into what i was saying this is exactly what they're doing with the geometry for what we're just reading they're trying to push uh trying to create it into a bending to suit over a cylinder because they need the propagation to work linearly I hope I explained that okay for you guys. Um, are we going to little g? <laughs> but I'm just saying that's more or less on very basic terms how they explain uh, bending and warping of space-time. Uh, yep, exactly. However, in cosmology, we are off by a factor of 1 and 10 by 20, Michio Kaku from principle, largest mismatch between theory and experimentation in the history of science. Yep, definitely. Okay, but let's carry on to what we're reading here. Then Wheeler. <laughs> okay, so thus transformation is that the cone with its apex at the Earth's center becomes a cylinder and the surface of the Earth becomes a plane orientated in which the axis of the cylinder is normal to the surface of Earth as a plane. You see what I'm saying you're saying? So they're taking it and they make it cylindrical and they are taking that straight and they're making taking the curve and they're laying it out flat now so it can be on that uh, on that graph layout. Okay, so the introduction of earth flattening approximation is credited to Schelling, Burroughs, and Farrell, who in an effort to simplify the analysis of the trans horizon field due to the curvature of the rays of energy from the source decided to transform a coordinate system where the rays become straight lines. This leads directly to the equivalent radius of the Earth's concept, or the so-called uh, four-thirds Earth's radius. Subsequent work considered to the Earth to be flat, which meant that the rays were bent upwards. This is no problem for the one interested in a solution of the differential equation governing the propagation of energy as proposed to the ray tracing technique. Price credits the final form of the transformation equation to C.L. Pecoris for the range transformation of the Professor E.T. Copson of the high transformation. Pecoris has shown that the error involved in making the small angle approximation is less than 2% for the ranges up to one half the radius of the Earth. Capson pointed out that the high transformation is preferable to the somewhat more in initiative 
in tissue, I can't pronounce, in, <laughs> intuitive, <laughs> intuitive, because the geodesics correspond to straight lines in the first case and approximately only straight lines in the second case. The ter differential equation with n, the height variable, as the independent variable will be referred. Ooh, they bring up independent variables. Okay, maybe we can write this down. Um, I see Nicholas is coming to uh, get everybody's attention to spout, to try and uh, de debunk his nonsense that he doesn't even know what he's talking about anyway. He says, there are two different forces at work. One of them is a downward orientation. Downward orientation is not a uh, force. Uh, Nicholas, maybe Nicholas should uh, define what mass is because he hasn't done that correctly, and he should define what a force is. There we go, Nicholas. Okay, so anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah, the radial uh, analysis error. So what does this show? We will call the range equation. Bakaris analyzed that the error involved in the approximating the height gain equation by Stokes' equation and concluded that the error becomes quite large at moderate heights. So the higher they go, the more the error. Cohen the Katzen shown that the height gain equation can be made exact by making a change of variable so that the height gain equation becomes Stokes' equation. It will be seen that the range equation transformation into Bezel's equation for order zero with a parameter. The solution to transformed range equation will be zero order Bezel function, and the solutions of the transformed height gain equation will be area, area integrals. So the area integral, that's what's showing the differential equation for the second order. Therefore, there are two linear independent variable solutions defined by the integrals. Uh, I think I'm going to stick this in the chat for you guys if you want the link for this. Yep, temperature change, uh, Roger. They wait unless they are super hot and then outward force could be stronger. Still not making, still not telling us uh, what's going on, Nicholas. Can you define mass for us? And then you can define um, weight, please, and then force. Because you do know mass and weight are two different things. Roger, he believes gravity that's not a force slows gas down somehow. Not understanding that uh, gas has, has molecular kinetic energy. So as it's moving around, it is transferring that heat energy to its surroundings. So in other words, it's even transferring it to other gases as it collides with them. Remember, gas is an inogenous, uh, which inogenous gas that has constant elastic collision. So in other words, it can never change direction unless it has a collision. Now they want to call it, look, gravity is a force, which gravity is not a force. And even giving gravity a force, it's too weak to do anything. Hence why you have idiots like Wes Wally trying to... I wonder if I can please show this. This should be funny. But before they do that, we really got a um, 28 votes. Will the show the ether to be true? Yes, 32%. No, 43%. And maybe 25%. Let me quickly go to Wes Wally's video. This was so funny because I haven't even got to it yet. Uh, where's Wally? Where's Wally? Where's Wally? I just want to get his uh, video where he wants to show gas pressure without containment. Oh man, this is this is funny. Uh, share this instead. Let's skip. Is it showing? Yes, okay, I'll try. This is so funny, guys. Hey, yeah, everybody. Good day, Wally. Here. Well, that's all. He wants a gas pressure without a container demonstration. Well, very simply, all I need to do is to show the sky. There you go, done. The... Did he just debunk us, guys, by saying, look, sky, therefore gas pressure without containment? No. I don't know how we can make this very very clear to him the sky is not a demonstration it is you claiming the sky has no containment 
it's the same as you standing at the beach and saying, because I don't see uh, the desert, therefore the desert doesn't exist. Let's put it this way. Who said you can actually see the containment? Who says it's even visible? All we know is you can't have the steak without the cow. So you can't have the gas pressure to have the gas pressure gradient without the containment. So pointing to the sky doesn't prove what you want it to do. Yeah, replicate it in the lab, please. They'll never do this because they can't. Earth too big. <laughs> but anyway, let's go on. Pressure down here is 14.7 psi on average, and you go up there, and it's essentially zero. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you know the pressure gradient changes ever so slightly with temperature? So um, I can be in my back garden, and when it's hot, it has a different uh, percentage temperature than when it's cold, because gas behavior, mate. No, there is no such thing as a container as things like meteors drop down into the atmosphere they get caught up by the earth's gravity well and they're sucked down to the ground wow and he got all this from looking at a photo uh okay what's the problem there first of all he's making a claim that meteors and asteroids come from space which violates natural law which you still haven't proven to be possible because you haven't proven gas pressure without containment so you've already thrown away the the argument you've already thrown away your argument because you already made a conclusion based on not proving the affirmative so i see meteors and uh, asteroids therefore no containment nah mate that's not how it works and gravity wells don't exist either <sighs> so let's get on now here is the sky a few nights ago as seen by my meteor camera. Wow. Clearly Beautiful. no container anywhere way up there. Well, then if you don't want to look up at the sky, then how about this? So here we go. We start on the ground, 113.02. Uh, Wally, or anybody in chat, can, can anybody tell me that phone, does it have a surface area to be able to read the barometric pressure so wally if you didn't have that surface area to have the pressure would you be reading that pressure reading wally well the simple answer is no 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 sorry sorry to break it to you but you still you don't get it if you put a fish in a fish tank and the fish claims look i got a pressure gradient in my fish tank therefore no containment the fish is already in the contained system this is exactly what you're doing here showing pressure gradient inside the contained system and let's go up um nicholas gas in itself does not really have it has what they call volumetric weight because it's calculated it's not measured it's when you take a scale you have a empty uh container well almost empty because you can't get a perfect vacuum to be honest so there's already gas in there and then you fill it up with gas and the volume of adding substance matter into the um, container lets the lets the weight go up so then you conclude based on a calculation that we've just measured gas having weight no that's why i said you have to go and you have to say this is the definition for gas i'm sorry this is the definition for weight and this is the definition for mass you still haven't done that you still haven't given us the definition for force either hey saddle bum good to see you man glad you can make it See here. Wow, it's changing. 112.8. Yeah. I wonder How why. Pressure changes. Oh. Same. To the Look starting there. pressure. So it seems there is a pressure differential. In yeah. And how many times do you have to explain? First comes containment, then comes gas. Then comes your pressure gradient. 
you don't claim I won the race and then run the race and then put on your shoes. Hey, Bob, the science guy. Good to see you. The only confused one here is you, mate. We've seen it many, many times, but thank you for coming. In other words, the Atmo at my feet is 0.2 of a hectopascal higher than the Atmo above my head. Now, Flatsoid copes with this by calling it a delta. He and Sovereign Souls and Sleepy Warrior <coughs> like to cope with the delta by following the company line and claiming that there is a gas pressure and claiming that the gas is made at ground level, so that's where more... No, let's put it this way. The gas at the ground is more concentrated because that's where most of it is reproduced and produced everywhere because you have things like cars driving around carbon dioxide. You have methane from cow farms, for instance. Anything you breathe, most of the plants, trees, everything, you know, is ground level. There's more surface area for gas to hit off of. That's all it is. That's why the concentration is higher at the bottom. Notice this is still not, con not still not showing us without containment. You still need a contained system to have the pressure, to have the pressure gradient. Okay? The reason we have most concentration of gas at the lower ground is because things like more surface to hit, concentration of gases, temperature variations. That's really it. So, as usual, Wally's actually still not getting the argument. More gas will be. It seems that my bamboo farts are all staying on the ground no. and not two meters up. That's despite the old Hamai bamboo being over 20 meters tall. That's why I say this gas pressure and gravity is their kryptonite, man. Now, this literally contradicts the other thing that they like to say, that is, the free expansion of gas law. Yeah, Jules, free expansion of gas. Do you know how that works? Uh, Roger Ledwell, $2 super chat. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, let's get back to the paper. I agree, but there's just one thing I want to show on here quickly. Really appreciate the super chat, Roger. I appreciate it. You rock, man. Uh, Mandela effect says, notice that I have a few channels calling out on things. Oh, they all call me out on things. That's all they ever do because uh, that's what I do. I step on toes. But anyway, just quickly uh, answering this before we go back to the paper. The Jules free expansion of gas is a thing. We live in a dynamic closed system, okay? And because we live in a dynamic closed system, we have dispersion of gases but we have things that overcome the expansion of gas, which is like temperature, movement of the gases, volume, collisions, reproducing of gases, transference of gases and energies. Oh, no. Still in containment. Okay, but while that's the answer, there's just, there was a specific one thing I wanted to show you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to show you guys something. This is what he was showing as he's a uh, <laughs> proof. If you're a business owner, for, uh, then for evidence, gas pressure without containment. And I was like laughing. Let's see. Look at this. He brings up, remember I showed on F with FTFE debate showing the simulation. Now he gets one. And uh, this is on the side here, gravity meter. Because now it's putting gravity in, okay? But I want you to see, it's already in a container, correct? And now the gravity meter is zero or there, which would, we can say would be it's uh, sitting at 14.7 percent. We're just going to say that is that is what gravity is at 9.8 meters per second squared differential, because that's what it's set at, okay? And then you get lots. So in other words, Based on their model, this is what you would get in reality. See what this simulation can teach us. So we can squirt two different gases, a heavy and a light species, into the container. Go ahead. Let's squirt in some heavy, and it seems to bounce everywhere like an expanding gas should do. Okay. Oh, okay, great. So that's with gravity there, guys, as the 9.8 meters per second squared force that they're giving their downward gravity, which is supposedly on Earth. It's con going what? In all directions, in a container. 
Okay, light. Okay. Okay, let's light the hot air balloon and make it lighter. Mm -hmm. And now the balloon rises. Excellent. Have we seen reality? Hmm. Now let's squirt in some of the light stuff, shall we? Hmm. And do a bit more. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like the two gases are mixing nicely, despite the gases being created down low on the right, where the. Yeah. Duh. You mean a very small container? Uh, maybe try a bigger container with now trees and boats and hills and valleys and mountains and open spaces and uh, reproduction and reproducing of gases, uh, cars, cows, photosynthesis taken into account, you know, that kind of thing. The pump is, by the way, flat soil. So much for the gradient being due to where the gases originate then. Show us how the guy doesn't understand how gas behavior works. Oops. Oops, yeah. Oh, look Oops for you. And look what he says. Oh, gravity meter. Now he goes and totally debunks the globe model, guys. Either at that slider. You didn't have that slider in your simulation, did you, Flatsoid? I have a feeling this simulation just got a lot more interesting. That's why I say this gas pressure and gravity. Seems that this simulation look. that we know Flatsoid will not have a problem with, as it's in I don't have a problem with it because it's making my point. How much is lots of gravity, guys? And that's the last point I wanted to put there. How much is lots of gravity? <laughs> it's insane. But yeah, uh, Roger, we're going to get back to the paper now, man. Thank you very much. Digital Intel, what's up, man? Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Glad you can make it. Um, shame. Poor Bob. Okay. So, let's move back to the paper. Oh, did I go out the paper now? But it's good to see you guys. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate you. You rock. Okay. Let's do this. What about the ether? Okay, so like I showed you the cone, that's what we were functioning on. Okay, the particular advantage of the airy integral formulation is rapid convergence property of the asymptotic series expansion of the airy integral solutions. The asymptotic expansion of the associated intervals of convergence are listed below. There you go. You can take that. I'll stick the link again for people like Bob, the science guy that wants to go through it. There's the link for you, Bob. Uh, I think you would really like it. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. So where were we? Okay. That just shows all the integrals. Where do, do, do. it should be noted that the second term of each expansion is about one tenth of the first term. The function and B's are chosen the fundamental pair in such a way that of the solutions would e decrease exponentially along the positive real axis and that both the solutions will be equal amplitude and oscillatory. The differing in phase by radian along the negative real axis. So as it's following the the cone, the one will have a differential in uh, in amplitude, thanks to its oscillations. Solutions are suitable for application of propagation problems because the first condition provides a solution applicable to wave propagation in a low C medium such as the Earth, while the second condition provides a solution which represents an outgoing wave at large heights, which is one of the boundary conditions of this problem. Ooh -ooh. In the particular problem at hand, the dis the set of the dissipative medium, the earth, is the region of negative, and the medium suitable for losses propagation is the region of positive. So the higher way, let's read this again. The earth is the region of negative, and the medium suitable for lossless propagation is the region of positive. So are they claiming that the atmosphere is now the, uh, the positive, and the earth itself is the negative, which causes the propagation to happen? Really positive, pop it. Access denied. Uh, access denied. Okay, let me, maybe I can save it. I'm going to download it and then send it. Uh, download. And then I'll send it as a. Uh, Uh, 
Uh, okay, you know what, guys? I will for you, Bob. I will actually, um, I will, I will get it onto a link form, then I'll send it to you guys. Okay, how's that? But it's good to see you. Hey, Shifty Eyes, good to see you, man. Thank you for coming. Yep, Jed, no curvature. Definitely no curvature. I don't know where these uh, people are trying to get into curvature. Okay, let's go. Uh, two identities involving air integrals, which will be considerable utility in analysis to follow. Ah, oh, there we go. If Bob wants to go through them, he can. Complete tables of area integrals and their derivatives and tabulation of the zeros of the area integrals and their derivatives are given in the mathematical tables. These tables allow ready evaluation of the expressions which will be developed for the field components. The area integral solutions will be used to formulate a system of equations whose solution will be used to weigh each term of a complete author orthonominal set of solutions of the differential equation in the other variable. The resulting integral will be complete field solution. So it's the green function. The solution of the differential equation governing the propagation of electromagnetic energy around the earth must be modified to account for the singularity of the source point so because the source point has a singularity they have to uh, make the differential equation because it comes from a single point source and uh, because it has what they what we read earlier it has the um, asymptotic relationship they need to get it to make it a linear function the Green's function is a function of which the statistifies the boundary conditions at the Earth's surface, represents the exponentially decaying wave inside the Earth, represents outgoing radiation at the great heights above the surface of the Earth, and whose derivative has the proper discontinuity of the source point. Assuming that the dipole of unit strength is located the height, d, above the surface of the Earth, it will be convenient to locate uh, omega equals zero line through the dipole, which then the uh, coordinates of the dipole are blah, blah, blah. This point will transform into the point in the central geometry of the flat earth approximation. The point discontinuity is represented by direct delta functions in the spherical polar coordinate system. The differential equation, which must be solved, can be written as blah, blah, where blah, blah, represents the second differential operation. In the case of homogeneous atmosphere or magnetic dipole in a spherical artrified atmosphere is lepsidian operator in this case of an electric dipole so so for all i'm getting from this bob says measure or assume all i'm getting from this actually is is the ether then the atmos is that what they are claiming the ether is because it has the atmos is the propagation for the um, electromagnetic field to go through that's practically what i'm getting from this whole uh thing so far but I still don't get how um, it's not correctly defined what the ETH is. Hey, into the break. Good to see you, man. Uh... <laughs> Bob used Chaldean Eclipse Calendar and thinks he proved the globe. Oh, no. Yeah, that's a flat earth proof, Bob. The Chaldeans are flat earthers. When you use the Soros cycle, you use flat earth observations when you use the mayans you're using flat earth oh and bob by the way why is it that like two weeks ago when so many flat earthers tried to go and view this solar eclipse no one was able to weird because your globe predicted it but uh no one saw it really odd bob you always use the horizon mate Okay, so these are just talking about how it's uh, doing the transformations. We obviously don't have to read through everything going just transformations because that's all it does. So this is the complete solution for the magnetic dipole. Uh, the separated differential equation and the field equation governing the propagation of electromagnetic energy from a magnetic dipole in an inogenous mediums R, and it gives the equations for that. It gives the boundaries, conditions uh just considering the field so in other words it's still just telling you yep you need the medium for propagation giving the velocities as it changes velocity with height okay 
Let's see, the boundaries are going on. I want to go to something more exciting. Where was it that they said they're doing the experiments? The, uh, I wouldn't say this is proving the ether, but I would say it is showing the Earth to have a diamagnetic um, point. So, in other words, the the argument from Witsit and them that the Earth has an a um, how can I put it a diamagnetic pull to the Earth because of this electromagnetic field. I say is plausible according to this paper, but the issue is it's still just a theory, quote unquote, and I, I still haven't seen any experimentation based on this, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, would I say it proves the ether? No, it's more or less just saying the atmosphere is the ether because you need propagation for the waves. And because the, the atmosphere is here for that propagation, therefore the electromagnetic uh, gradient is able to go through <coughs> and propagate based on the atmosphere. It's probably got to a reading. So uh, the complete solution for electric dipole, the case for propagation for electric dipole located in an homogeneous medium is somewhat more difficult to analyze than the case of a magnetic dipole because the differential equations are more complicated. However, it will be possible to make simplifying approximations at approximate points to facilitate the analysis. The separate differential equations and the field equations governing the propagation of electromagnetic energy from the electric dipole in a spherical structure in homogeneous medium are blah, 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 blah. And it's just giving all of that again. All they're doing is just making uh, differential equations to equate for the solutioning of trying to have it on a sphere. That's practically all this is showing. Comparison with experimental data. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what we should get to. Experimental data. Oh, Nicholas. Flats, you are dumb. You're dumb. What? If you're dumb channel, Bob, you are. Oh, I thought you said I'm dumb. But yeah, Bob is uh, not the smartest. Uh, Smartest guy around. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. The guy takes two theodolites, one on the ground that side and another one on the ground that side, and thinks they are at the same level. So, yeah, that's quite sad. From Bobby Science Guy, brah. <laughs> yeah, brah. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can get all this on for you guys because I can't actually go on much longer. Uh, got some things to do today. But there we go. It's showing the um, showing the comparison with the calculated field strength. As you go up in height and stuff, it changes how uh, they try to get it into a... The field strength change. Thank you, clearly, for us, please. Yes, long hello. Okay. So, yeah, my conclusion to this is, I'll definitely go through it in much more detail as well, but my conclusion to this is, does it prove the ether? No. But I will concede that it does show evidence to us having a dielectric tendency on Earth. So showing that we, it is possible that we have that uh, electromagnetic gradient. And therefore, if you claim the atmosphere is the, the ether, then, yeah, then that's the ether proven. According to this paper, that's about it. So yeah, guys, sorry, the kids are getting restless. I think it's time to get going to help the kids. Um, uh, Bob, even the flat earth has a radius. Maybe I can quickly explain radius to Bob on a flat earth. I told you, Bob's not the sharpest tool in the shed. And I'm making my point right now. So window, share. 
hide. Okay. Okay, Bob. Let me quickly show you this. We're going to have a circle. This is a circle, Bob. This is a flat circle. What is the radius? That is a radius, a straight line. So tell me how we cannot have a radius on a flat earth, Bob. Because let's say you standing in the middle there, and you have a 360 degree boundary, you have a radius to that boundary. There we go. Well done. Thank you, I believe. Okay, so guys, I have to go. Thank you guys for coming. You guys are awesome. I'm going to see you tonight for another stream, and then it's the O's in chat again. So it's supposed to be tonight. It was supposed to be this morning, but he got the dates wrong. So I'll see you all tonight. Many, many blessings, and uh, yeah, may the pressure be with.